I see myself as a cyborg. I started thinking of myself as a cyborg when I, I guess when I started wearing a mechanical hand there. Having that human-machine hybrid. At least when I think of a cyborg, I imagine someone who spends a large part of their time dedicated to repairing and upgrading themselves. The more I get into the cyborg thing, the more I start to see technology as a way to achieve our best self. It's not about becoming some kind of universal ideal here, it's about becoming your own ideal, what you feel you should be. When I was growing up, if I ever told you that I couldn't do something, it was mostly just because I didn't want to. Most of the problems that I had due to my limb difference was mostly due to um, social issues. Like, I was kind of a small kid anyway growing up, and kind of the geeky one, and then on top of that, I was the kid with the funny hand, and I ended up getting picked on a lot. When I first heard about this hand from my dad, I thought it was just the coolest thing ever. Occasionally he'll have some really out there crazy idea that I'm a little skeptical of, but this time I didn't need any convincing. I mean, how much convincing do you need to give someone a robot arm? I didn't really know what I'd be making with a 3D printer up until I saw the video of a little boy in South Africa named Liam, who, through the wonders of 3D printing, had received uh, a mechanical hand. Uh, a couple guys had developed the design and uh, we were uh, able to download the design. They decided to, to, to post it and share it, share the design. So that summer, uh, which was the summer of 2013, uh, we assembled our own device. So we solved a couple of problems uh, differently in our, own, in our own way. We were able to put together a hand that, that worked pretty well. It was really cool, but it wasn't all that useful yet. Um, I was breaking fingers, it was uncomfortable, uh, not very strong. So it was really that ability, that freedom to play with it and modify it and upgrade it that allowed us to get to where we are today. No two hands are the same. Um, you say limb difference, and they really are all different. This one's this one's mine. I've got kind of an ideal candidate for this. I've got most of a palm, fully working wrist, and it fits uh, fits this design pretty well. Um, this is not always the case. Uh, we've got a lot of there's a lot of variation. Um, there's um, sometimes it's a question as to whether someone has enough wrist to use one. Um, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. There's a lot of work that goes into making the hands work well with the particular user. Uh, no, a little bit more. Just recently, we've been working with a children's hospital in Marvel Comics to give kids some superhero hands. We've been working on the Spider-Man hands down in the shop. It's really cool to be making superhero hands for kids. There's a certain beauty in the device not looking like a human hand. Because if it looks like a human hand, it looks kind of creepy. But also, that it, but also it, it, it covers up the limb difference. And what this does is it makes it special. It helps the children to own their difference. And so uh, I, I think it's, it's great that they asked me to do the, the Spider-Man hands, because Spider-Man's always been my favorite. <laughs> My name is John Schulm. My current position is a research scientist in MAGIC. That's RIT's Center for Media Arts, Games, Interaction, and Creativity in Rochester. And I am founder of Enable, a global network of volunteers using 3D printers to make prosthetic hands and give them away for free. He said he gave up, so I gave up. No, you don't give up. Okay.
When I saw that video, I realized that there was an opportunity to piggyback as that video went viral. And I added a comment to the YouTube videos uh, in which I said, if you have a printer and want to help, put yourself on this map. And if you need a hand, put yourself on this map. I'd made a Google Map mashup where people could just add pins with their names on them. And that was enough to propose or pretend that people would start signing up, self-organizing, and mass fabricating free prosthetics for each other. And, you know, unusually enough, uh, it actually started to happen. Within six weeks, there were 70 people on the map. And of course, they didn't just self-organize, they started calling me saying, so now what do we do? And uh, I had no idea, but we created a Google Plus community. And it's been growing by about one or two percent per week ever since and we're off and running. My daughter and I first heard about Enable when we were at Nova Labs in Virginia. We were playing with the lasers and we saw that there were fingers being printed on a 3D printer and asked questions about that and those guys told us about Enable and what they were doing. It just sounded too good to be true. And then we took that back to our scout troop and told them what was happening. And there were so many families that wanted to get involved that they actually went to Enable's conference. It was called Prosthetists Meets Printers. And it was at Johns Hopkins Hospital. It was an incredibly informative conference. And we gathered there and decided after hearing what our advisors had to say there that this was something that we could really engage the youth in as a global service project. My daughter has a really wonderful interest in STEM, and to give her the opportunity to have real hands-on experience seemed incredibly rare. Uh, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, has always been a field that I've found to be a lot of fun. It's where I felt I've worked best. This project has been a joy to work on. It was a whole new way to look at the world. This is a way that you can make a difference in people's lives. In the local community, we're able to work with kids up to like 150 at a time at our huge workshops. And Enable has shown me that there is an opportunity for me, you know, as a kid. It's the fact that I'm able to help lead others to better themselves and better others is kind of a huge part of my life and it means a lot. We also heard about a group called Communitaire, which sets up 3D printers as part of disaster response. And we thought to ourselves, there ought to be a way for those two to get together. We got our first advisors on how to print, and we got our first medical advisor, Dr. Albert Chi. Um, three weeks after that, he told us he was being deployed, and we had 48 days to learn how to 3D print, to learn how to print and assemble these devices. We knew we were helping people who couldn't print for themselves. Tonight in the kitchen, we're going to be dumping out all these sticky hands that were, and dusty hands that were assembled by Cub Scouts and scrub them and dry them off. We're going to check them to make sure that they operate smoothly and safely. And then we're going to package them up and send them to the team in Haiti. It's a huge team effort, but I think it's awesome. And it goes to show that kids, you know, teenagers like me, anywhere really, given the right resources and people can accomplish great things. A lot of people want to learn what we've done and work with us, and together we're creating not only more devices, but more designs that will help these kids. And it's transformed the adults. It's transformed these kids who went from, some of them wondering if they mattered at all, to planning to be engineers and looking forward to a future where they made a difference. And the kids who thought that they weren't going to be able to use a limb are teaching us how to be better designers because we're listening to them as clients. And it's transformed what we've thought these devices were for. It's really a form of self-expression and it's really been a very powerful message of hope. And it's been a change in thinking. So it's not really been about the hands. It's been about changing the way we think people should help each other and how this could happen.